I've been doing this quite a bit. And um, one of the, you know, we talk about what, what webinars would be beneficial to uh, uh, the H, uh, human resources and the h &S professionals. And um, effective auditing and corrective action is one I've always wanted to do. Uh, it's a key element to every environmental health and safety system. Um, it's also required in certain situations where you may need to re uh, get an ISO certification or if you're working on an OSHA or VPP sharps. But it's also a great tool for like small to medium sized businesses just to reduce risk uh, and improve working conditions. So the goal here is to talk about the different types of audits. Uh, there are many different types, but also talk about some some things uh, that are good to do and some things maybe uh, to watch out for when you guys are, are doing these audits. Um, so what is an audit? Why do we audit? Well, it's basically a proactive approach to measure the health and safety performance of an organization. Again, it could be a large corporation, a large facility, um, or it can be um, um, a small place, a small to medium sized business. So uh, it helps in developing criteria for improvement of the organizational both strengths and weaknesses. And we identify those weaknesses, we wanna make corrections. Uh, but it also provides a platform for taking effective planning decisions. Um, when you have an ongoing audit process, you are continuously improving your workplace conditions uh, and setting up a systematic approach, not only to identify these issues, but to correct them, assess them and correct them uh, effectively um, is, is, is what continuous improvement is all about. So it is a useful tool, like I said. Uh, why do we audit? Okay, well, the main thing is we want to identify these hazards. Okay, we definitely want to provide a, a, a safe workplace for our employees. Uh, we want to reduce risk. Um, we'll talk about different types of audits, but we're also required to measure compliance uh, with OSHA regulations and so forth. So we may structure audits that are uh, strictly compliance audits. Um, that's usually a good place to start. Uh, we also measure safety performance. When we get into safety management system audits, uh, we have uh, more mature and robust safety systems. Uh, becomes more of a, a performance-based audit uh, in, in that case. Uh, we also uh, audit to achieve certification. Um, and I'll mention ISO and VPP throughout the presentation. Um, auditing is, is, is a big component of um, ISO. Um, and over the years, I've learned a lot uh, with that process because there's actually an auditing criteria and a standard and it outlines a lot on how you plan, how you execute, and how you deliver audits. So the main goal here, and we'll talk about it continuously, is continuous improvement. We want to make sure our organization and our employees remain safe. Okay, so objectives of our safety audits, okay? Uh, the objective of a safety audit is to evaluate the effectiveness of organization safety effort and make these recommendations. And those recommendations are all aimed at reducing accidents and minimizing risk. So when we have a well-structured and continuous audit program, we're actually seeing the actual status of the health and safety program. Uh, we're identifying weaknesses, but we're also recognizing success. Uh, that's one key component that a lot of people will overlook. Uh, if you're auditing and you identify a process that's working uh, extremely well, that process may be used for other areas within your organization. So it is, um, it is good to recognize success, and it's also a good reinforcement tool for management and employees when you, when you point out you know, what they're doing that's, that, that, that's, a, that's good. Um, we also evaluate compliance, and then we'll talk about policies and procedures, but we'll determine the adequacy of those policies and procedures, how they're used, are they used correctly, are they accurate, uh, et cetera. Okay, so I mentioned before there's different types of audits. Again, there's uh, audits for small to medium-sized businesses. There are large corporate audits. Uh, but what I try to do is kind of pinpoint these down into the five major areas that, uh, that I've seen over the years. Um, the first is your compliance audit. Uh, now, remember, with compliance, OSHA is the minimum standard, so a lot of people will start out with just compliance audits. The next step usually involves uh, program audits. That's when we're going to look at our health and safety programs and look at the effectiveness of the design of those programs and whether or not we're actually carrying out what we say we're doing in those programs. Uh, more robust uh, audits include management system audits. Uh, we have certification and registration audits, 
And then gap assessments. Um, we do a lot of those gap assessments for companies that are just getting started. Um, and uh, they can be a great tool to, to measure your readiness uh, of where you are in respect to either achieving a certification or maintaining compliance. And I mentioned before, you can, companies can, can design any type of audit that they want. Um, some, some of these audit, audits can be a combination of both, one or more of these things. And it's really, uh, it's a good idea to, de to design the audit for your needs at that particular time and always to maintain an audit program, um, changing it based off your needs and current situation. So, like I said, some of these audits can have a combination of one or more of these uh, different types. Well, let's talk about compliance audit. So, this is basically your most base, basic audit. Um, this is kind of the starting point. You know, again, regu regulatory standards are just the minimum. They're the very beginning, uh, but we do need to comply with those. So a lot of folks will start with uh, compliance audits. And OSHA actually doesn't require you to do these audits. However, you are required to furnish employees with a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards. So typically in these audits, we're gonna be looking for unsafe conditions as they relate to um, OSHA regulations. On these, we'll be doing walkthroughs. Typically we'll see things like machine guarding issues, uh, personal protective equipment issues, fall protection, see a lot of electrical hazards, so this is a good walkthrough to, to, to measure your compliance with uh, the OSHA regulations. Now, the next step is when we get into the program audits. Um, so companies were required to have health and safety written programs. Um, and I see a lot of times that people will have very robust programs that, uh, you know, they're, they're 40, 50 pages long. But when we go do a program audit and we go out and measure uh, the effectiveness and design, they're only doing about 10% of what they say they're doing. And really, the purpose of these programs is to provide consistency on how you maintain your, your safety program, who maintains it, where records are kept. So this is a good uh, measure of design and efficiency. Um, it's analysis that gauges the implementation strategies of these programs. So um, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of having very simple procedures. Um, uh, a procedure when you write it should be written such that if somebody, if there's turnover and a new H EHS person comes in, they should be able to read that procedure and know exactly what they're supposed to do. So it comes back to the ISO saying is, are, are, are you doing what you say you're doing? Okay, so these are effective because if you rely on these programs and use them, they provide consistency. Okay, the next type of audit is a management system audit. And again, these are more comprehensive. These are for more ma uh, mature health and safety systems. Uh, they take a, an approach both, both to look at compliance, uh, written programs, and they're basically a performance audit. These audits actually uh, are more extensive. They get into worker interviews, compliance reviews, workplace observation. Uh, one that I don't have is here on here is document review, uh, but they're a performance-based standard. And a lot of management systems um, are designed by like corporations uh, for internal auditing and so forth. But they, they, they look at many different elements and they look at it from a performance standpoint. Next, we have certification or registration audits. Again, you'll see a lot of these uh, are similar to safety management system audits. Uh, we have the ISO 14001, ISO 45001, um, OSHA VPP and STAR, uh, as well as OSHA SHARPS. Uh, one thing I don't have on here is a lot of corporations have internal management system certifications uh, that's required by their locations. Um, they'll design uh, the safety management systems and audit them accordingly. So, again, these are comprehensive as well. Lastly, I have gap assessments. And like I said, mentioned earlier, uh, when you're first getting started, um, either with your health and safety program or you're getting started maybe looking at getting a registration, a gap assessment is a good tool to measure the readiness or status of, of where you are. Um, so what we do there is, first of all, determining what we're going to measure, the scope of either compliance regulation or registration audit. And then we go and perform the gap assessment. 
we're going to be looking for any missing requirements. Uh, we'll also look at the adequacy of existing requirements. Do we have everything in that uh, in that element, and is it fully implemented and executed? And then lastly, we come up with these actions to complete the gaps. And again, this is more of a, a readiness status, uh, allows the facility to say, okay, well, maybe in a month or two we'll be ready, or hey, we're ready next week, let's, let's pull the trigger. I won't get into all of these, but these are some of the key elements that are often measured in audits across all different types of audits. Uh, a lot of like management commitment, um, you'll see that in a lot of safety systems audits, roles and responsibilities, goals and objectives, um, hazard prevention and controls, and also a, an important element. But we're also going to look at uh, things like emergency procedures or first aid procedures, competency of employees, training records. Uh, so there's a lot to audit. Um, and again, you can design your audit criteria uh, based on your current status and needs or your requirements uh, that you need to follow. So a question comes up, who conducts the audit? Well, there's typically an internal audit. Uh, people do internal audits or they'll have third party audits or do a little bit of both. The key important thing to remember with an auditor is you must have auditor independence. Um, you must have an auditor that uh, has impartiality and objectivity uh, for what they're auditing. So, for example, if, if um, we're going to audit the shipping department, do we want the uh, warehouse manager leading that audit? Um, there's no independence there. So that's one that's really, really critical. Uh, one of the things to remember. Um, there's also sections where you put audit teams together. Um, one thing I would recommend is when you do audits, um, don't just... Um, don't just say, okay, we're going to go out and do a, do a health and safety audit. You want to train your auditors on how to audit, what are good auditing techniques, how to plan and design your audits, how to communicate. Um, that way, the audit will go much, much smoother. Um, and we'll talk about uh, planning here uh, right now. So audit preparation is, is key. Um, so, again, we may be in a situation where we're going to audit for four or five days. So we want to make the best use of that time. Or sometimes we may have a situation where you're only going to have one day to review all of this. So planning is key. So the first thing we want to do is establish the scope of the audit. What are we going to measure for? Is it going to be compliance? Are we doing ISO? Um, or are we doing some other uh, corporate standard? Um, and then after that, we, we determine the audit criteria. What are we going to measure? Okay. We then start the preparation process. The, we communicate to the organization. One of the things I like to do is let folks know, hey, these are the things that we're going to be looking at. These are the records, the documents, the, the training records. Uh, this is what we would like you to have, have like you to have ready. Um, uh, especially with the ISO audits, because that makes the audit process go much smoother. Um, the other thing I also recommend would do is review any past program area audits, area audits or corrective actions that were from previous audits. Uh, that's a big part of the ISO. Um, you know, we had an audit last year with the ISO. Did you correct it? Uh, did you verify the effectiveness of that correction? So those are all important things to remember. Um, if it's going to be a compliance audit um, and it's out of a state where you're not currently in, you'll want to look at any of the local state uh, requirements for OSHA. There are state programs that have differences, uh, particularly in California. So if you were going to do a safety audit or regulatory audit in California, you want to make sure that you have the proper criteria and then you're referencing the correct standards. Uh, develop audit scope and audit plan. And then send that plan to the affected personnel uh, a week or two prior, and then we develop an audit checklist. Now, an audit schedule um, I don't have on here, but that's very important because what that does, that's your 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 hour by hour, day by day schedule on what you're going to measure and when you're going to measure it. What that does is that keeps the audit moving uh, efficiently. Um, that also makes sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and, and it's also a useful tool I've seen when audits start to get out of the scope or uh, they start to veer in a different direction, that audit schedule will get you back on track. 
and that's something that helps you uh, maintain a good audit uh, momentum. Then we go into completing the audit itself. So typically with an audit, this is what, what you'll see, um, you know, you want to do an introduction if you're going to go in a facility or one of your peer sites, uh, do a quick introduction, uh, having management there and some supervisors is good. You're going to review the scope and schedule and make sure that um, everybody's on the same page and then you'll have the adequate resources to perform the audit. You know, will the managers be available at the times that they're supposed to be? Once we go into performing the audits, we wanna collect objective evidence. We'll do interviews. Uh, pictures are also very useful. Um, it's important that you, you identify the location as well uh, because, um, you know, companies, you know, when you when you write something down, you want to make sure that they're able to find that hazard that you pointed out or that particular uh, program or training record. Um, a detailed description of the activities. Um, a lot of times you want, if you're going to be auditing to criteria, reference maybe the OSHA standard or the ISO element. Uh, and then I always like to look at severity and priority, okay? One thing that I would recommend is if you're in a multiple day audit, um, you know, if you're traveling or if not, at the end of the day, I would I would write up what you guys found that day. Because if you're auditing multiple days and you don't do that, and maybe a few days to the next week before you start looking at it, and you may forget some things. Um, so it's always good to collect the evidence and document what you found that day uh, at the end of that day. That way um, you don't miss anything and you have a clear understanding and you're not trying to remember something that happened a week ago. Some of the things that we're gonna focus on in audits, written programs, training records, compliance audits and permits. We'll also be looking at site conditions, physical and environmental hazards, um, safe and unsafe uh, behaviors or observations. Those are things we wanna look for as well. Um, if we see something serious, um, we need to notify the client immediately. Uh, we may have to stop the audit in certain circumstances, but it's something very serious. We need to stop that process and get people involved. That does happen sometimes, um, but that's that's kind of like a near miss to say, wow, I'm glad we stopped this. This could have gotten, gotten worse. So some of the other things to, to focus on in auditing is emergency, emergency situations, person, personal safety, your visible health and safety hazards. Um, if possible, if time permits, I always like to, 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 to review OSHA 300 logs or um, incident uh, registers to kind of see if there's any trends or where the troubled areas may be. Also look at regulatory history. Um, if the company's had any citations or fine in the, fines in the past, I want to go verify that they're actually taking care of uh, the item that they were cited for, um, and then any local, state, or federal regulations. Um, so once we've completed the audit, once we've documented everything, it's time to start discussing putting the report together. Um, the safety report is very important. Okay, uh, we want to present it in a standardized format. Uh, typically, what you'll see um, with an audit report is who the auditors were, uh, the date of the audit and finding. Uh, and again, I referenced location is important. Uh, if you point out that there is a missing ground pin at a floor fan, well, the company may have 200 floor fans. So we need to let them know where that is so they can find it and fix it. Excuse me, uh, description of the finding applicable regulatory requirement, and then a photo if, if applicable. So once you put your audit report together, uh, you have all the, the details outlined. I also like to provide a uh, an executive summary, which, which kind of summarize, summarizes the overall audit, your visit, what you saw, identify the strengths, major weaknesses, trends perhaps, um, and then um, and then it's time to prepare to present the audit report. Uh, what I like to do is set up a meeting, uh, typically with the, the people that you did the intro meeting with, uh, depending on who's involved with health and safety, but a lot of the senior managers. When you set up a deep brief with these folks, um, you wanna discuss the findings, address severity, uh, always discuss trends. Um, 
and 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 because if you see trends then um when you get into root cause analysis you can solve many issues by solving one issue uh and then offer suggestions and recommendations okay but typically with these um i always like to put kind of an audit summary together versus going through the 20 or 30 page audit with the managers but put together a powerpoint or a presentation that, that summarizes what you found so once we've done that um you know that's that's typical typical typically what audits uh encompass the next part of that um that I want to discuss was 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 corrective actions, um, the audit review and corrective actions. Um, effective corrective actions, not everybody does them effectively. Uh, and we're going to talk about root cause analysis and so forth. But when we find something or we get an audit report, we want to make sure that we implement an effective uh, and manageable corrective action. So when we review these findings, we're going to look at uh, various trends. Um, one finding may exist in multiple locations. I look at low hanging fruit and then set priorities. So when we get these and we find these, uh, find, when we have these findings, we want to set corrective actions up. So when we do that, we'll do issue the finding what it was. Um, we'll do a root cause analysis on that finding. Uh, once we determine the root cause analysis, then we're going to do a corrective action. So at that point, we want to describe what we're going to do to correct that issue. We'll assign ownership, um, and again, ownership really shouldn't just be one person. Um, ownership on corrective action should include all of those people at all levels of the organization that are going to make sure that that corrective action is implemented effectively. Uh, target completion date. So we always want to have a, a next step, if you will. Um, the target completion date may get moved uh, depending on um, resources and so forth, but we want to have that target completion date. And then once it's closed, we'll go ahead and close out the corrective action. Now, one thing I always recommend is a follow-up to do maybe a 60 or 90 day follow-up. And we want to review the effectiveness of that corrective action. So if we implemented something to, to correct a, a, a finding, let's go back a month or two later and see whatever we did or whatever we implemented to see if that's still in place. Um, I've seen a lot of times where people will get an audit, they'll get the report, they'll fix it, and then they forget about it two or three months later. So a good corrective action that's effective uh, will is sustainable uh, as well. And the other thing for management commitment is, is, you know, management, they need to have the responsibility to see that these audit conclusions and recommendations are implemented by the agreed target dates. And what I typically see there is if we have an audit or a large audit, we'll set up a set of meetings and um, we review those on a regular basis until everything's complete. Uh, but again, we want to get multiple people involved. Uh, get the right people involved, uh, give them um, authority uh, and hold them accountable to, to implement these corrective actions. And then also let's do a follow up. Um, so root cause analysis is, is, is an effective tool for corrective actions. Um, you know, out in the work area, I see this is an area where uh, some people struggle, if you will. Um, you know, instead of just putting a Band-Aid on it and fixing it, forgetting about it, uh, doing a holistic um, analysis and root cause analysis of the finding um, will better sustain a long-term solution. Um, so there's several tools to do it, but we basically want to remedy the root cause, not just the symptoms. We may have both short-term and long-term solutions. Um, when we do a root cause analysis, we may, may find that there are multiple root causes, okay? Again, we want to focus on how and the why something happened, not who was responsible. Um, and then cause effect, we want to look at those to back up root cause claims. Um, and then we also want to provide enough information to inform, inform a corrective action course of action. Um, and then consider how root causes can be prevented or replicated in the future. Um, so basically, you know, you heard the term, let's just not put a Band-Aid on it. But if we actually get to the root of, root of the problem, um, it may actually solve other issues throughout the organization. Um, a lot of times when you do root, good root cause analysis, you'll find that it's a systemic issue. Um, it could be a management issue. It could be a resource issue such that if you fix that, that higher level issue, 
that may address other areas or issues throughout the facility, uh, maybe in other departments or um, other areas. So it's worthwhile to do the homework. Uh, the other thing I would recommend also is, is those who are doing the root cause analysis. And, and I'll mention also accident and incident investigations. Train your people on how to do it. Um, train them on how to do it effectively, because if you're going to spend the time to do it, do it correctly, and you'll find that you'll end up solving other problems. And you'll also find that that corrective action is sustainable, uh, and it actually carries some weight and, and will be effective. Some similar root cause analysis tools that you guys will see, fishbone diagrams, 8D forms, five whys are, are, are uh, popular, uh, FEMA, failure mode analysis, fault tree analysis. Uh, many organizations use some or a combination of these various techniques. Uh, some folks have their own, but if you're gonna pick a tool and use it, make sure you train your people on how to do it effectively and then hold them accountable. If you see a, a corrective action, or I don't wanna stray here, but like even on an incident report, if, if you look at it and the root cause wasn't really determined, send it back and say, hey, how can I help you fix this? Because this isn't sufficient. I think we have some more work to do here. Again, focus on how and why it happened. So corrective actions, um, you know, those are, those are good to have. Um, it's kind of a summary here. Um, you know, auditing can be, it can be a stressful situation, uh, especially if you're the auditee. But the main point to remember is to work together uh, and also communicate. Um, effective planning gets everybody on the same page, and that allows the audit to go smoothly. Um, it also breaks down some of the barriers. Um, and I put these two together, you know, as an auditor, you want to understand the process. You want to have great communication with the parties involved. Do your planning and preparation. Always be professional. OK, professionalism is there's key elements, even within the ISO standard of professionalism. And uh, I've been in situations where audits have stopped. <laughs> a new auditor had to come in um, just because it, it just it, it started it got out of control. Um, I'll put in here open ended questions and I didn't get too much into interviewing techniques, but having open ended questions and, and having people listening to what they're saying, putting them at ease and listen to what they're saying, you'll get a lot more information versus just a yes or a no. Uh, verify and collect the objective evidence, stay on schedule. Uh, that's another important thing from the planning. If we're going to do a schedule, let's stay on it and then use some various audit techniques. And again, train your auditors on those audit techniques. Uh, it'll again, make them better auditors and you'll get better results for the auditee. Again, it could be very stressful. If you're going to have a bunch of people coming in for a week, looking over your shoulder, measuring what you did, but let's understand the process and be prepared. Hopefully, as an auditee, you'll get uh, the audit plan. You'll get the schedule. There's nothing wrong with putting uh, folders together and show them what they're looking for. That makes the audit go much smoother, eliminates frustration. Uh, and keep, keep in mind, this audit that you guys are getting as the auditee is a useful tool. You're going to get great information out of it. It's going to help you make the health and safety program better uh, and then make the workers safer. Professionalism is important. And the other thing I, I put in here is this is a great learning experience. So when if you're an eh &S professional and you're getting audited, I would involve various uh, folks such as committee members, safety committee members, maybe some supervisors, get them involved in the process because it's a great learning experience for them. They'll learn a lot. They'll learn more about their internal system, but they'll also learn more about maybe how they can improve upon it. But it's just a good experience. Uh, forever. And the other thing is an auditee, I would also say that, you know, if you're getting audited and getting asked questions, think outside the box a little bit about inquiries because um, you may be actually be doing what they're asking, but it may not be obvious. So sometimes think out of the box. There's many different ways to satisfy a requirement that may not be obvious. That if you do do a little bit of digging and thinking, you say, oh, wait a second. Yeah, we, we do have this. Uh, we just do it in this other department or we do it in a different way, but it's here. And you present that evidence to the auditor like, hey, it's great. And it works and, 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 and it's sustainable. So the main thing is to work together. Uh, conclusion, many types of safety audits, okay, uh, regardless of the types of the safety audit, uh, it plays an important role in checking compliance, 
consistency of program implementation, and then overall safety performance. And what my main thing I say is, main thing I say is, make the most of the process because you're going to be invested in it. Um, make the most of it uh, and use it as a learning tool to improve your health and safety program. So uh, that's all I had, um, Nathan. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. That was fantastic. At this point, if anyone does have questions, please type those into the chat window. I do have a couple that have already come through. The The first one was, is there any recommended or even required frequency for any of these audits or just a, a suggestion in general? How often should they be done? Um, typically, yeah. So um, that mostly comes into play with maybe a registration or certification audit. Again, OSHA doesn't require that you audit, uh, but registration audits like... Um, ISO would require you to do internal audits at least once a cycle, which is once a year. Uh, compliance obligations through um, ISO is once every three years. Um, the VPP process requires a self-evaluation on an annual basis. Uh, but a lot of corporate uh, companies, and even with our partnerships, our small to medium-sized businesses, we put together an audit schedule. But as far as requirements go, that goes back to the registration or certification bodies. Okay, great. The And you did mention, touch on this earlier, but someone did ask, are there some tools or resources that we can go find, look at, or use to help create these type of internal audits? Sure. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, you can Google some stuff. <laughs> um, you can, I will tell you this, um, and it depends on what type of audit that you're looking to do. So let's talk, for instance, with the certification audit, or excuse me, I'm sorry, a compliance audit. Um, OSHA, for example, has what they call a general industry checklist uh, that's available on work sites or, or, excuse me, on their website. That's a good way to uh, get information on how to do a compliance audit. Um, National Safety Council has some. Um, as far as um, like a safety management system audit, uh, the VPP model is a great model to to start to look at. Um, it is very robust, uh, but what you can do is, you know, if you're not going for VPP, you can pull out the elements that you think are important or relate to your facility um, and then go from there. And again, you it, developing audit checklists and scope of audits and criteria, it's ever changing. But yeah, I would check uh, OSHA website, the VPP. Um, you can purchase, um, the ISO standards really don't give you that great a criteria. They're more just, uh, you know, a standard. Um, but National Safety Council, CDC may have some stuff. But, uh, but yeah, and take all that and, and then make it specific to your site. And then, again, remember, those can always change. Uh, if you have a certain process that's new or if you had an accident or near miss, you want to add that, whatever corrective action is or whatever led to that accident, add that to your audit report and then that way you can continue to check for the effectiveness 